So the beginning is defining sound. So the first thing we're going to do is to come up with the definition of sound. What is sound? And I thought the best way to do a def defining sound is to take an object that produces sound, which is a tuning fork. Believe it or not, before we had tuners, we had this. Uh, piano players tuned to this thing. Piano tuner, sorry. Okay. So what is this object, when it does not move, doesn't produce any sound. So the first thing we define is what is sound. Sound is a perception of a vibrating object via a medium. So to have sound, we first to have, to have a perception. There is no sound that is not perceived. So the very definition of sound implies that somebody or something is receiving a specific kind of signal. Okay, so let's, let's break that definition down. Sound is a perception of a vibrating object via a medium. In our case, who is perceiving? We are. The vibrating object is the tuning fork. The medium is the air. We wouldn't be able to have sound if there was no medium that would go be between the vibrating object and our ears. Okay? But there's something very interesting about this definition because um, this definition implies the sound is a perception. And even though this sounds kind of, is that very important? It is exceptionally important because the perception is not an objective, uh, is not objective by definition. A perception is unique. Okay, I'll give an example. Uh, please take your hands and put behind your ears like this. I will take pictures of you and mail it on whatever you have, YouTube or... Okay, now listen to my voice and take your hands away. And listen again to my voice. Does it sound different? It does. Meaning that I had you to have a bigger ear, your perception of my voice would be very different. Meaning that um, Ryan versus Forrest here is a slightly different perception of myself. So perception is subjective. And if it's subjective, it's subject to all lot of other principles that affect that are studied by something called psychoacoustics, which is the connection between the vibration of an object and what it does to our brain. Okay? Why is this important? Because when we engage in sound, we are dealing with a perception. In fact, a lot of sound engineering, if, if you give me some poetic license, has got to do with creating a illusion. If you think of an album, I know you love music, otherwise it wouldn't be here. Okay, you put your headphones on, uh, the, iP the iPod on, you're listening. And suddenly you go, in, you go into a zone. Am I right? Does that zone exist? It doesn't. It only exists in your brain. Music only exists here. It doesn't exist there. In fact, think of a song, your favorite song. Think of it right now. If you think of a song, can you think of it now? Okay, now play it very loud. Okay, can you play it loud? Is it real? It's only in your mind. Sound really only exists here, which is an incredible concept, which we're not going to explore. But sound is a very, to a great extent, very spiritual thing, because it doesn't exist here, it only exists here. In fact, there is a book that I read, which is quite beautiful. It's called uh, Mixing with Your Mind. Because sound has got everything to do with the mind. Now, this is a very interesting uh, thing that they discovered. They discovered, they, they analyzed the brain of a lot of different um, occupations. So policemen, uh, doctors, and then they came to a sound engineer. And what they analyzed was what type of waves were generating or generated, what type of activity was generated in the brain when whatever they were analyzing was working. When they came to a sound engineer, it looked like he was resting. So they got to the guy, he was mixing the engineer that they analyzed, and they said, 
what on earth are you doing? I said, I'm working. Well, it looks like you are meditating. He says, the only way, the only other time we found this behavior was in a Buddhist monk meditating. Okay? So why I'm saying this, and I know it sounds like a bit out of context. A lot of what I say is out of context. But a lot of what I do is to stretch your mind. Because sound is here. I, I, it's not about this. It's not about maneuvering. Or oh, now it's the mouse. Sorry, I'm used to the analog stuff. But it's not about maneuvering knobs or mouse. It's all here. Sound is all here. So the reason why I'm saying this is that you want to increase your skill in mixing, in your understanding, in your hearing. You, I'm sure you want to do that because you wouldn't be here otherwise. Okay? If you want to do that, the thing that you have to cultivate the most is meditation. Isn't that weird? So, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian, so from a Christian point of view, it's meditating on the things of the Lord. And as we meditate, we actually increase our capacity to mix because mixing is all here in the, in the, in the, in the brain. Sound is all here. Okay, let's go back to the definition of sound. So sound is a perception of a vibrating object via a medium. Let's say it again. Sound is a perception of a vibrating object via a medium. So the first half to sound, I said there's two aspects of sound. The first one was the perception side. Sound is a perception. But the second aspect of sound is the vibration. Remember, I used the tuning fork and as it stands still you can't hear anything but when I give it energy and it vibrates you start to hear something. Now this, this um, describes the second aspect of sound which is the scientific part of sound because now if there is a motion I can dissect that motion, I can analyze it, I can figure out what happens when this thing moves at the specific speed and, and whatever science does, okay? So suddenly there's another aspect to sound which is the scientific part, which is the part that studies and analyzes the vibrating object. Okay, now let's think of music. You are in a room, you are the perceiver, you are the receiver, but there's a guy playing drums. Okay, now the guy playing drums is giving energy to an instrument the instrument vibrates, the air does its thing, and then you perceive a drums, a drum kit, okay? Now what science does, science can study very accurately what happens when that drummer hits that drum kit, the way it develops, the way it moves, and all of that. Okay, you and me. Now that, for me, denotes the second aspect of sound. So I always, which is more scientific, which is the production of sound. So we got two aspects to sound. One is the per perception, the other one is the pro production. So we got our ears, our brain, and then we got the tuning fork. The same is the two sides of the same coin. So you can't think of sound just with perception and brain. That's a big deal of it. Without that, there wouldn't be any sound. But there's another portion of it, which is the vibration of the object. Think of it as like two languages of the same thing. So as an engineer, you need to speak both languages. So on one side, I would call this the, the, the language of production, the language of science, which you should be able to talk fluently. And then there is the sound of perception, which is more the sound of music. Okay? I, I, I don't know if there's any musician, if any of you, I know Michael plays. Do you, any of you play an instrument? You don't play an instrument, okay? You, you, you play me. So we've got two musicians and, okay, so you have an understanding of notes. Okay, now, if you play an instrument or been in a contest, but you've done sound for a few people or not, okay, have you have, so you have had doing sound and the band is on the, on the other side, am I right? Now, if you have done sound, you might have relate to what I'm, some of the terms I'm going to use. The musicians never uses a scientific language to describe something, am I right? For instance, does it say, um, or oh rather, let me say what he says. It's, he would say to you, um, the sound is too nasal, 
Have you ever heard that? Oh, the sound is too boxy. Oh, it's, it's very dark. Uh, can we have it brighter? Or would say to you, it's a bit thinny. Or it's a bit thin. Or it's a bit um, boomy. Can you relate to these terms? Are those scientific terms? They're not. They're perception terms. In fact, to be really honest, here I have on this, on, on my machine here, I'll put it on the bigger screen. There's a lot of numbers and there's a lot of things, but none of it says uh, if, it, if it sucks, push this. <laughs> if the singer is nasal, push this button. Okay? If it's boomy, um, adjust this level to the other side. Does it say that? It's just a lot of numbers, a lot of information, but actually it doesn't help me if I speak the language of music. Because nowhere does it say they're nasal, or does it say boomy, or bright. Can you understand that? So now I have a challenge, and the challenge is how can I interpret those terms, which are the commonly used in the music language, and apply it to sound? Because if I'm able to do both, if I'm able to speak both languages, then I'll be able to do sound. Because then I can understand what a musician wants and translate it into a scientific terminology. Okay? Are you getting this? So sound has got two languages. The language of production, the vibration, the guy in the lab studying with, with, under the microscope, this thing moving, science. In fact, if you think about it, um, a lot, lot of audio gear comes from these very um, North European uh, places where you can imagine the guy sitting there with the glasses and the, and the white thing in a sterile environment doing what he does best, which is a scientist. The language is the language of science. But musicians very rarely speak that language. Now, what is my point? My point is this. For you to learn to do sound engineering, for you to do sound, you need to be fluent in both languages. And in fact, the more fluent you become in both languages, the greater your skill as an engineer. Because if you speak the language of music and the language of science, then you'll be able to get what you want out of the equipment. It is really not about the equipment, it's about how you use that equipment most of the time. Obviously, the, the better the quality of the equipment, the less the problem and the easier it is to use to an extent. But ultimately, you can have the, the fastest car in the world. It's not going to go fast unless the driver takes it there. You can have a Ferrari Formula One car in the hands of myself, I'm not going to go very far with it, most probably, because I won't know what to do with all those buttons, okay? <laughs> so I have the vehicle, but I do not have the skill to drive it. So that's why one of my favorite things is ears before gear. And unfortunately, we live in a society that really maximizes on gear, but ears before gear, always. So do you understand these two, the, the two principles, the, the language of science and the language of uh, music? So we have, on one side we have perce perception, and on the other side we have production. Now in, in, in sound, however, even though there is two sides, there is a very important key. And in fact, in your notes, I've written that five times. And if I, if, uh, all, the older I get, the more lines I put there. So one of these days, I'm going to have 20 pages of just that. And what does it say that the key to sound is? Listening. Listening. I, but it doesn't say one time. How many times does it say? Five. Five. So the next, what does it say there? The key to sound is listening. 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 And I know it sounds really obvious, but it isn't. Do you know 90% of any musical problem are rooted to a lack of listening? If you have a, a band that doesn't play well together, have you ever asked yourself why? Because they're not listening to one another. Very simple. It's not really because obviously it's maybe because of a lack of skill, but if they would play 
at the level of the weakest musician, they will still get away with it because they will keep things very simple so that even the, 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 the last skill of them will cope with it. We're not gonna have fancy code, we're gonna have very simple codes, we're gonna stick with the three codes and we're gonna move through this song like that. But because we're not listening, I'm not aware of my band member skill, okay? So, but despite music and music playing, in sound engineering, the greatest problem is a lack of listening. So I find myself, even when I do an album or if I'm engineering live, that at some point I go into autopilot. You know what that means. You might not know what it means. It means I don't listen anymore. I just do things because that's the way I generally do them. I do this on the bass drum. I do this on the vocal. I do this and that. And then I've stopped listening. And then I find myself, I catch myself not listening. And I go, what are you doing? And what I'm doing, I am not listening, which is the wrong thing to do. So the key to sound is listening. You remember Elias spoke about the, the, the sound is in the mind? And I spoke, I gave the example of meditation. You see, interestingly enough, listening requires a decision. Listening requires also a discipline. Uh, I don't know how many of you talk to people, but maybe you have come across somebody in your life that you speak to, but he's not listening. Or she's not listening. I don't know. Maybe you've got a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, or whatever, a friend. You're speaking to that person, she or he, but he's not listening, or she's not listening. Okay? Do you know what I'm talking about? So you can't afford that when you do sound. Because the key to sound engineering is listening. The key to sound is listening. I can, in fact, right now, you're paying for to be this, to do the course, you could be here, but you're not listening to me. So you're wasting your time and you're wasting your money. But you can welcome to do it because it's your decision. You see what I mean is that listening requires a decision. It requires the will to stop from thinking about anything else and focusing on this very thing. It requires concentration. And that's why there's actually very few good engineers, because most people can't concentrate for long. In fact, even this class will be challenging for some of you because you would like the concentration to follow me. And if you do sound for two, three hours, in a show maybe an hour and a half or two hours, you cannot stop concentrating. You cannot, well, okay, let me go to the toilet. You know, you can't do that. You can't for a moment, oh, sorry, I'm just busy here. And sometimes what you do get busy with is you get busy with the gear. That's the easiest distraction. Engineers get very busy with the gear. I have a number of wonderful stories to tell on how I've seen people working on gear without any understanding. But they look very impressive and they look very busy, but they've got no clue because they're not listening. So what is the key to sound is? Listen, okay, you got that one. I'll, I'll say it another hundred times. But uh, as it says there, five times. And as I say, the older I get, the, the more lines I want to add to that. The key to sound is listening. And as I said, one of these days I'll put hundred.